All right, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know it's summertime and it's tempting to be other places, but I appreciate you coming here today. Uh, I'm gonna talk today a bit about the work in our lab focused on mixed dimensional heterostructures with a focus on electronic and energy technologies. Before I talk about mixed dimensional heterostructures, though, let me first introduce the family of low dimensional nanoelectronic materials. These will be the constituent materials of the heterostructures. I'll begin first with two dimensional carbon or graphene. This is a one atom thick sheet of sp2 bonded carbon, famous for its high charge carrier mobility. Also, a useful construct conceptually for imagining other low dimensional forms of carbon. For example, if you cut out this green shape here, roll it up into a sphere, you get a zero dimensional fullerene. If you cut a rectangle out of the graphene sheet, roll it up into a cylinder, you get a one dimensional carbon nanotube. And of course, when you cut out this rectangle, you can imagine changing the width and therefore the diameter of the nanotube or the angle of that rectangle with respect to the graphene lattice. And that would change the chiral vector of your carbon nanotube. You can also imagine taking graphene and stacking it up into a three-dimensional solid. And that, of course, would be graphite. In practice, though, we rarely go from graphene to graphite, but we go the other direction, exfoliating graphene flakes from graphite. And once you learn how to do that exfoliation process, you can then look at other layered compounds, such as hexagonal boron nitride, exfoliate that down to the 2D limit. That's an electrically insulating material molybdenum disulfide and other transition metal dicalcogenides. These are typically wide band gap semiconductors, typically n-type doped. You can imagine taking other elemental 2D materials such as phosphorine, which is the phosphorus analog of graphene derived from black phosphorus. This is a narrower band gap semiconductor, typically p-type doped. And you can even imagine taking elements that do not form layered materials in the bulk such as boron, but instead of trying to exfoliate, since you can't, since they're not layered, what you do is you grow them directly in the 2D limit, and that allows you to achieve borophene, which is a metallic 2D system. <clears throat> the bottom line is that this is just a handful of the dozens, if not hundreds of possible materials to choose from. And yet, even with this small number, we already cover all electronic properties from electrically insulating to metallic to several semiconducting band gaps in between. And as a result, if we could layer these materials into heterostructures, we should be able to realize any and all electronic device functionality. And this is enabled by the fact that the bonding between these materials is van der Waals bonding. And that, of course, leads to the concept of a van der Waals heterostructure. And the great advantage of a van der Waals heterostructure is that you can now form an atomically sharp, well-defined hetero interface without worrying about epitaxial lattice matching, which is what is constrained compound semiconductor heterostructures. And this concept is one that's very popular in the 2D material field. You'll find all sorts of 2D, 2D van der Waals heterostructures, and we, we do that as well. But what our lab contends is that any passivated dangling bond-free surface interacts with another via van der Waals forces. And as a result, you should not feel constrained to 2D materials alone. Instead, you could look at mixed dimensional heterostructures, where, for example, you would layer 1D system on top of a 2D system. And what that would imply is that once you cross the hetero interface, you can qualitatively change the nature of the electronic density of states. You can also qualitatively change the degree of dielectric screening. And as a result, these mixed dimensional heterostructures are going to have distinct properties from their individual components. And that's going to lead to new physics, new properties, and ultimately new applications. And that is the concept which uh, is a unifying theme in our lab at the moment. And so let me move into the bulk of the talk uh, where I'm going to discuss, first of all, how we produce the constituent materials for a mixed dimensional heterostructure. I'm going to talk about solution based processing that's industrially scalable and compatible with additive manufacturing. I'll then move into the heterostructure portion of the talk, where I'll focus on two types of technologies neuromorphic computing and energy storage. But before we get to the heterostructures, let's talk about how we isolate the constituent materials. And so, how we're going to do this is to try to draw inspiration from the field of printed electronics. 
But instead of using the typical organic or nanoparticle inks that are popular in that field, we're going to attempt to make such inks from the family of low dimensional nano electronic materials. And this is motivated by the fact that the low D nano electronic material field has already demonstrated superlative properties and device prototypes based on idealized research samples. In the 2D material field, this is the so called scotch tape or micro mechanically exfoliated 2D systems. So we know the properties of these materials exceed that of your typical organic or nanoparticle ink. The problem though is how do you actually make an ink out of 2D materials? And that's what our lab is attempting to do is to unite these efforts, preserving the superlative electronic properties of 2D systems while having them in ink form and thereby taking advantage of all of the attributes of scalable additive manufacturing. So that's of course the easier said than done. If you actually wanna go do it, there's four distinct design goals that have to be met concurrently. The first is exfoliation. By that, I mean, you need to be able to peel away the layers from your bulk layered material in a manner where you maximize the yield throughput and have preferably atomic scale control over the flake size. Then once you have that highly monitored dispersed nanomaterial, you need to make an ink out of it. So you have to engineer the solvents and stabilizing polymers to get the right rheology for printing. Then recognizing that the size of your printed structure is almost certainly going to be larger than the constituent materials where you're actually printing is a percolating network. And therefore the morphology of that thin film will of course have important implications for the final properties. And therefore schemes for controlling that morphology are critical. And then finally, again, acknowledging that we're gonna have a percolating network where we have flake flake contacts. Those interfaces within the percolating film need to be controlled. And how you control it depends upon the properties you're going after. For a conductive ink, you wanna minimize the interfacial and contact resistance. For a dielectric ink, you wanna maximize capacitance, minimize leakage currents. And for a semiconductor ink, you want to maximize mobility. And in the case of a transistor, the switching ratio. So the way we go after this is to first focus on problem one. How do we achieve effective exfoliation? And among the exfoliated materials, how do we have exquisite control over their structure and therefore their properties? And this is a problem that has been pursued in our lab for over 15 years. And in particular, we began by trying to address the issue that's present for carbon nanotubes. The first issue is that when you grow them, you tend to get bundles as opposed to individual nanotubes. The way you break them apart or exfoliate them is to put them in the appropriate solvent, such as water, add a surfactant. This would be an antiphilic surfactant in an aqueous solution. Sonicate or otherwise agitate the solution to break up the bundles, form micelles around the nanotubes, and that will allow you to have them individualized. Because this is an imperfect process though, you then need to do a post exfoliation separation. And this is achieved using a method called density gradient ultra centrifugation, which separates nanomaterials by their buoyant density. And since buoyant density depends upon size and shape, you achieve size and shape control. Moreover, since the buoyant density depends upon the surfactants that are used, Clever surfactant chemistry allows you to achieve other separation targets, such as separating metal from semiconducting carbon nanotubes. So this method, while first pioneered for carbon nanotubes over the past decade or so, we've shown can be generalized to other nanomaterials, such as graphene, where we can now separate single layer, bilayer, trilayer graphene. Metal nanoparticles, we can separate by size, shape, and therefore plasmonic properties. Other layered systems such as moly disulfide, boron nitride, black phosphorus, and so on, also can be separated by thickness, or if you wish, by lateral size, by operating in the transient separation regime. The bottom line is that essentially any nanomaterial now can be isolated in an industrially scalable manner with atomic level precision. And one of the most recent examples from our lab, which I'll spend a slide talking about, is the family of transition metal halides with ruthenium trichloride being the prototypical example here. This family of materials is quite interesting and has 
exotic magnetic properties, optoelectronic properties. Previously, this family of materials has not been isolated in solution. Uh, the likely reason for this is that the bonding between the layers is tighter than you have in a traditional van der Waals solid. And so the way that you overcome that issue is you pre-intercalate ions between the layers that will increase the layer-layer spacing and facilitate solution-based exfoliation. The question that I'm often asked is, after you do all the solution processing, have you compromised the properties of the material? And in the case of ruthenium trichloride, you may be wondering, are the magnetic and optoelectronic properties preserved? And so what I'm showing you here is a series of magnetoresistance curves where we see the expected transition from positive concavity to negative concavity at the phase transition temperature around 230 Kelvin. On the right, I'm showing you the optoelectronic response, in particular, the photocurrent response at near infrared wavelengths. And this is indicative of the fact that ruthenium trichloride is a strong MOT insulator, and we're able to preserve that photo response even following solution processing. The bottom line is that even these exquisite condensed matter physics properties are preserved following the solution processing. And just to drive the point home, how this methodology that we use to generate monodisperse nanomaterial dispersions is one that is scalable. Our company, Nanointegris, scaled this process up by 10,000 fold, initially for carbon nanotubes, but over the past decade or so, it has diversified into many other nanomaterials. These are available, you can see the website here. But what I want to stress is that what Nanotegris is going to sell you is either a dispersion or a powder, not an ink. An ink not only needs to have monodispersed nanomaterials, but also tailored rheology for your targeted printing method. And so that leads us to the next challenge. Once I have highly monodispersed nanomaterials, how do I generate a printable ink? And the way you do it is to introduce additives to the dispersion. And in particular, the additive that we most commonly use are cellulosic polymers, such as ethyl cellulose. What ethyl cellulose allows you to do is to increase the concentration of almost any nanomaterial in alcohols by 100 to 1,000 fold. And this allows you to move into a solids loading on the order of 10 to 50 percent. And at that high solid loading, it's no longer the viscosity of the original solvent, but much more viscous. Inks and slurries can be realized. Of course, you can also dial back the solid loading if you wish. And that means that you can now tune the viscosity by over four orders of magnitude. And that allows you to prepare a range of inks for diverse printing methods. For example, inkjet printing is a method which requires very tight control over viscosity. What I'm showing here is that we can get nicely printed lines using inkjet printing, which is illustrating the tight rheological control we have. Now, one issue is that once you've printed this line, you no longer only have graphene present, you also have the polymer, ethyl cellulose, which is not conductive. And so as printed, these lines would not conduct current. However, if you heat them to 250 degrees C for 30 minutes in an oxidizing environment, you can largely volatilize the ethyl cellulose. That will lead to a compaction of the film, and that will improve the flake-flake stacking. In addition, there will be a small amount of amorphous carbon residue that remains, but that amorphous carbon is templated by the graphene, giving you a high sp2 content. And that way, you get facilitated charge transport between the flakes via pi-pi stacking interactions. The net effect is that you get very low resistivity or equivalently high conductivity. And that amorphous carbon residue also provides a mechanical reinforcement that makes these lines quite durable, allowing you to flex or even fold them without compromising electronic properties. So that looks pretty good. The, the issue though, is that many materials in particular a low glass transition temperature polymers are not compatible with 250 degrees C. Furthermore, if you imagine roll to roll manufacturing, you don't want to have to stop the roll to cure your ink for 30 minutes. And so you'd like to go faster and have a lower temperature process. And this is achieved by replacing thermal annealing with photonic annealing. In photonic annealing, we use a broadband pulse xenon lamp. 
This broadband light source is absorbed in the graphene, not in the underlying substrate, leading to local heating of the graphene film, keeping the substrate cool. This process is very efficient. In literally one millisecond light pulse, you achieve the same curing you get for 30 minutes at 250C, which implies that this process is now faster than the printing itself. And as a result, you never need to slow down your roll-to-roll -roll process. Some examples of where we use this printed graphene includes electrochemical biosensing. We target this application because in electrochemical biosensing, you're typically putting your electrodes into a saline solution, which will corrode most metals. Graphene on the other hand is very inert chemically, and as a result, you preserve the electronic properties in this environment. How the sensor works is you pattern, in this case via aerosol jet printing, an interdigitated electrode array. This interdigitated electrode array, when you put it into an electrolyte and you apply an AC voltage between the contacts, will get a measurable impedance response. That impedance depends upon frequency, and if you choose the right frequency, you can become highly sensitive to the so-called charge transfer resistance at the electrode electrolyte interface. And what that implies is that if you now functionalize your electrodes with a biospecific ligand, then upon binding of the target analyte, the charge transfer resistance increases, and thereby you can get an electrical readout. And this method is quite uh, flexible. We've used it for cytokine detection, for immune system monitoring, for histamine detection, for food safety monitoring. And over the past two years, we got a new target, and that, of course, was the coronavirus. So we now have printed graphene electrodes for electrochemical COVID-19 detection. In particular, what we're detecting is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which we can see is clearly detectable in the impedance spectra. And importantly, this is a selective sensor. So if you were to expose this instead to the H1N1 hemagglutin protein, you see no response. So you can differentiate a COVID case from a traditional flu case. And just to drive the point home, the broad rheological tunability of the ethyl cellulose polymer allows us now to dial in viscosities for a wide range of printing methods. In addition to inkjet printing, we have gravure printing, screen printing, even 3D printable graphing. All of these are available commercially from Millipore Sigma. The question then becomes, can I do something beyond graphene? And the next target we went after was molybdenum disulfide. This is a semiconducting ink. Ethyl cellulose, as I alluded to before, is almost a universal dispersant. So it also disperses uh, MOS2 effectively. Like the graphene inks, we can tune the volume fraction and thereby tune the viscosity for whatever your favorite printing method is. In this case, I'm showing you inkjet printed lines on both glass and polyamid. When you do this printing, of course, the ethyl cellulose is still present and therefore we need to remove it via thermal or photonic annealing. And if you do so, what you're gonna get now is in the electronically percolating MOS2 network. Since MOS2 is semiconducting, we would anticipate that it would have a photoresponse. In particular, if we were to shine light onto this material with an energy greater than the band gap, we should photo excite carriers and thereby see a higher current flow. And we indeed see higher current with the light on and the light off. This a photo detector is fully printed in that the graphene contacts are also printed. What I'm really trying to show in this view graph though is that the way in which we cure the film has a dramatic effect on the final properties. If we look at this plot here, the responsivity versus time response, the red data point is where we do thermal annealing. Remember thermal annealing occurs over 30 minutes. It's a very controlled process. It leads to very good flake flake stacking and that facilitates charge transport, which means that you get a very fast time response. But most photo detectors, including these, tend to have a higher photoresponsivity when you have a higher defect concentration. And the thermal annealing films, since they're so ordered, have relatively low responsivity. In contrast, if we use photonic annealing, which is the blue data point, remember photonic annealing occurs in a millisecond. We have this massive evolution of gas phase products from the ethyl cellulose decomposition. It's almost an explosive process. And that leads to a much more disordered film which slows down the time response, but gives you more defects for higher photoresponsivity. The bottom line is that the final properties of your printed structure depend not only on the quality of the material and the quality of the ink, 
but also on the nature of the curing method, since that influences the microstructure of the percolating network. So that looks pretty good, but if you actually quantitatively analyze this photoresponsivity, you'll find that it falls well short of what you would expect for a direct band gap semiconductor. And the reason is that with the ethyl cellulose based dispersion, we typically get several layer thick MOS2. And once you go beyond the monolayer, MOS2 transitions from direct to indirect gap. And as a result, you're going to get a much weaker photoresponse than you would expect in the monolayer limit. Fortunately, in very recent work, we've learned how to thin our flakes down. We do this via so-called megasonic atomization. What does that mean? That means that we put our ink into a chamber. We expose it to ultrasonication at megahertz frequencies. This will aerosolize the ink, which in the field of aerosol jet printing is referred to as atomization. This aerosolization process, if we let it run, in other words, we aerosolize, recondense, aerosolize, and repeat for 30 minutes or longer. What we observe is that the color of the solution changes. The optical absorption spectrum correspondingly changes. And in particular, you see these two peaks emerging. These are the excitonic peaks that are well known for monolayer MOS2. Furthermore, if this is indeed a direct band gap semiconductor, photoluminescence should be much more effective, as you see here. And so we take our inks, we subject it to megasonic atomization that thins it down now to the monolayer limit. And therefore, we'd expect that this would perform even better in the photodetector application. And this is the case if we now make the same photodetectors I showed you before. We first of all look at the printed film. We see that these flakes are quite large, they're micron scale, they're atomically thin, and yet they're being printed in a flat morphology. And that's enabled by the incorporation of a high boiling point solvent, namely terpenol, into the ink to control the rate of evaporation and to prevent crumpling from occurring during the deposition process. So with thin flakes, large flakes, and a flat morphology, you indeed see significantly higher performance. You now get the same fast millisecond time response, but in addition, you get 1,000 fold improvement in photoresponsivity. So this we think is a significant step forward in now realizing the full optoelectronic potential of printed 2D semiconductors. The final example I'll give in this portion of the talk is hexagonal boron nitride. Remember, this is an electrically insulated material. It can also be dispersed with ethyl cellulose. We can also tune the solid loading and thereby tune the viscosity from a low viscosity inkjet printable ink to a high viscosity direct ink writable or blade coatable ink. And in this high viscosity limit, the resulting films are quite thick. You can see micron scale and thickness. These films, when you burn out the polymer, are porous. And as well, we can now make freestanding films, which would appear to be effective for filtration and membrane applications. Uh, indeed, we've begun exploring this in the context of lithium ion battery separators. In a lithium ion battery separator, what you want is an electrically insulating material, with H, which HBN is, but you want it to be porous to enable ion transport to allow lithium ions to go from the anode to the cathode and back. The way these separators are typically made is using polyolefin. And polyolefins, of course, work if you're at room temperature. But if you heat up polyolefins, they undergo catastrophic irreversible damage. And if this happens in your lithium ion battery, then your lithium ion battery will also go up in flames. And that is, of course, the catastrophic failure mode that electric vehicle manufacturers live in fear of happening. And so what we've done is replace the polyolefin now with an HBN polymer composite separator. The HBN is much more uh, refractive than polyolefins. And consequently, we can now expose it to high temperatures and maintain mechanical integrity. This implies that you're going to have greatly improved safety and lithium ion battery technology. OK, so let me move on and discuss now our efforts to move into the realm of heterostructures. In the area of mixed dimensional heterostructures, we have many ongoing efforts in our lab. This includes efforts in neuromorphic computing, uh, print electronics and batteries. I'll talk in detail about both of these topics today. 
Due to limited time, I won't talk about the next two, but if you are interested, you can check out these review articles where you can hear about some of our emerging work in quantum information sciences and also what we call polymorphic heterostructures. But today, as I said, let me focus on the first two topics, beginning with neuromorphic computing. So since I'm guessing that everyone in the room has thought a lot about neuromorphic computing, let me first introduce the concept. Neuromorphic means brain-like computing. And what we're gonna to attempt to do is not simply make conventional transistor technology smaller, but instead rethink the circuitry to better mimic how the brain does computing. And the reason you'd wanna do that is twofold. One is that the most popular algorithms in computer science today are artificial intelligence and machine learning. And you can probably guess that if you're trying to mimic intelligence, it would make sense to have a brain-like hardware platform in which to run such algorithms. The second reason is that the brain is much more energy efficient at computing than traditional digital electronics. And this becomes particularly important in the high data limit. And the reason is that in the high data limit, the architecture of conventional transistor technology leads to high power consumption because memory and information processing are performed in separate locations and moving the data back and forth dissipates a lot of power. So what we're going to attempt to do is eliminate that bottleneck, which is present in current computing. Doing that with conventional transistor circuits is possible, but I will note that there are issues, including the fact that the architecture of conventional transistors is two-dimensional as opposed to the three-dimensional architecture of the brain. And as a result, there's a lot of work going on in looking at alternatives to the transistor to enable neuromorphic computing. The memristor is one of the favorite choices. This is a resistor that remembers its voltage history. These memristors often resemble the form of ion channels and synapses, so that sounds pretty good. It's similar to a neuron. But if you look at the performance of these devices, they tend to be best suited for memory, not so well suited for information processing. In addition, memristors are typically two terminal devices, which of course is very different than the brain in that each neuron in the brain can have hundreds of thousands of interconnections. The hyper interconnectivity of the brain is something that's very difficult or probably impossible to achieve with memristor technology. And so in our lab, we've really tried to rethink neuromorphic devices from the bottom up. If we're gonna to attempt to mimic a biological neural network, then your solid state device would ideally be able to achieve sophisticated voltage spiking analogous to the action potential in neurons. So you need highly nonlinear responses. You'll be able to perform memory and information processing at the same point in space, preferably at the device level. Can we somehow combine the memristor and transistor into one device? And can the base devices have multiple terminals to enable higher degrees of interconnectivity than a two terminal memristor? And so how do we do it? Well, we now build mixed dimensional heterostructures, in this case, combining two dimensional N-type molybdenum disulfide with one dimensional P-type single walled carbon nanotubes. And if you make such a heterojunction, what you get is a P-N junction, and therefore you get a rectifying current voltage curve like a traditional diode. And that in and of itself is not so interesting because P-N junction diodes have been around since the 1930s. But what's different about this p-n junction diode is that the constituent materials are atomically thin, which means that the entire thickness of the device is less than the dielectric screening length, which means that these devices are highly gatable. And in particular, what we're going to make is a dual gated heterojunction where we're going to have a top and a bottom gate, where we can exploit the fact that the screening in nanotubes is weaker than in molybdenum and therefore these two gates are asymmetric. And that combination of asymmetric dielectric screening coupled with the mixed dimensional PN heterojunction now gives you exquisite control over the nonlinear current voltage response. And this is uh, some characteristic uh, current voltage curves from that device. What is being plotted here is the current through the device as a function of the gate voltage, the so-called transfer curve. And what you can see in this transfer curve is that when you're at high negative gate voltage, the device is off. And the reason is that you fully depleted the end side of the junction. If you go to the, P, to the positive voltage side, you also turn the device off because now you've fully depleted the P side of the junction. 
and therefore only at low gate voltage is the device on. And so this transfer curve looks like a Gaussian. This is often referred to as a Gaussian heterojunction transistor. Gaussian output curves, I'm sorry, Gaussian um, <clears throat> transfer curves are famous in neuromorphic computing because if you can control all the parameters of the Gaussian, such as the peak height, the peak width, and the peak position, then you can very efficiently realize the action potential of biological neurons. And in this device, because we have dual gated control, we can achieve that full degree of tunability. So here's an example of the resulting artificial neuron circuit. We take one of those Gaussian uh, mixed dimensional heterojunctions. We connect it to a few other standard circuit elements like resistors and capacitors. And if you take the simple circuit and you input a constant current, the voltage as a function of time output will show the spiking behavior you see here. And this looks very similar to the action potential in a biological neuron. What's interesting though about this device is that based upon the voltages that you apply, you can fully tune this response. You can tune the peak width, the number of peaks, the spacing and time between the peaks. And so what you have here is an artificial neuron, which is more tunable than a traditional biological neuron. And this provides many opportunities for advanced artificial intelligence algorithms, including competitive learning. So that's the neuron part of our neuromorphic circuit. We also need the connections between the neurons, which are known as synapses. And synapses in neuromorphic circuits are typically realized using memristors. The reason is that as you apply pulses to a memristor, you begin to, in a non-volatile manner, modulate the conductance of the device. The question is, can we do this in a manner where we can achieve more tunability? And the way we do that is to take a memristor-based technology. This is a memristor based upon polycrystalline molydisulfide. Fashion it into a two-dimensional planar geometry such that we can gate it from the back. And again, because this is atomically thin, we can fully gate the current voltage response. And as a result, the gate gives us a transistor-like response. And so what we've combined into one device is a two-terminal memristor response between the source and drain, coupled with a transistor response from the gate. This device we call a MEM transistor for short because it's combining a memristor with a transistor. Here are the current voltage curves. They're quite interesting. Let's first look at the ID, VD, or output curve. In the positive bias regime, you can see a strong hysteretic loop. This is the memristive loop you'd expect for a two-terminal memristor. Interestingly, at negative bias, you see a much smaller loop. This is our first hint that the action in this device is happening at the shock key contact. And that implies that you'd expect some asymmetry at that shock key diode. In addition, if we now look at a series of output curves, for different gate voltages, we see strong modulation by the gate. In fact, this tunability is on the order of 10 to the sixth. And so this is a very good transistor while concurrently being a good memristor. So we've successfully combined the memristor and transistor into, into one device. In addition, this device is working because when we apply the voltage between the source and drain, we're driving defect motion through the channel. Those defects are the dopants in the device, and thereby we're reconfiguring the doping profile in the channel. What that implies is that if we now pattern additional contacts to the channel region, you would anticipate that if you applied a voltage between contacts five and six to redistribute the dopants in the channel, that you would modulate the current flow in the orthogonal direction. And we can see that is the case here. I'm plotting the current between contacts two and four versus the voltage between two and four as a function of pulses applied between contacts five and six. And we see a clear shifting of these curves. This is a so-called heterosynaptic response. This is something that's famous in biological neurons, but unprecedented previously in solid state electronics. And of course we can put as many contacts as we want in the channel region. And that gives us many options for interconnectivity, which again, better mimics biological neural networks. In addition, because it's atomically thin, we can gate not only from the bottom, but also from the top, making a dual gated mem transistor. This has many advantages, particularly for integrating these devices into dense crossbar arrays. 
in that you can use one gate to determine which point you're going to address in the array, and then the other contexts are available for operating the device. So this allows you to minimize crosstalk or the so-called sneak current problem that's famous in memristive crossbar arrays. In addition, dual gate control gives you more control over the synaptic response. And in particular, what you want for pattern recognition algorithms is a linear and, sym and symmetric synaptic response, which is very nicely achieved using the dual gated MEM transistor. The bottom line is that this is a device which depends upon the context for the Schottky injection. It depends upon the dielectrics for the gating. It depends upon the defect structure of the channel for the memristive response. And as a result, if you now dial in the optimal parameters for all of those materials, you can achieve exquisite gate control over the potentiation and depression response of your synapse. This is quite useful in a variety of contexts, particularly enabling continuous learning and spiking neural networks. This is a concept which is well known theoretically in the computer science literature, uh, but difficult to realize in hardware. This device allows you to do it, and it thereby allows you to circumvent the, the traditional trade-offs between image recognition accuracy and resource allocation. This is a very efficient spiking neural network. Okay, let me move on uh, to the final example, and that is now looking at where we can use mixed dimensional header structures for energy storage technologies. And so the question that we posed in our lab a few years ago is, is there some way that we can use these solution process nanomaterials to add value to battery technology? And in particular, the lithium ion battery, since that's the most ubiquitous battery in portable electronics and electric vehicles today. And so if you look at a schematic of a lithium ion battery, you of course have an anode and a cathode. You have a separator preventing them from shorting. Typically a liquid electrolyte to facilitate lithium transport between the two sides. But what really caught our eye in the schematic were none of those components, but instead these two layers here, the SEI layers, the solid electrolyte interface. The SEI is arguably the least understood and yet one of the most important components of a battery. It is what occurs when the electrolyte is in contact with your battery at the potentials where you're beyond the thermodynamic stability window of the electrolyte. And what happens in those conditions is the electrolyte decomposes and forms a thin layer at the interface. That thin layer tends to evolve as a function of cycling. And this is why batteries tend to degrade after a large number of cycles. If you could better control the SCI, you should be able to improve the lifetime and performance of lithium ion battery technology. And this caught our attention because this is a very thin layer. It's, it's kind of similar to a two-dimensional material. And so if we were to put down a 2D material in place before we did any cycling, it could perhaps take the place of the SEI. And so we sought to do this. Of course, in a battery, what you have is a composite of a large number of active material particles with a conductive additive. And the question is, how are you going to get a thin graphing coating on each and every particle in this composite electrode? The way we do it is we begin with our graphing ethyl cellulose inks. We add to it the active material, in this case, lithium manganese oxide, which is a cathode material. We blade coat it, evaporate the solvent, and cure it. And if you do this correctly, what you'll get is a conformal coating around each and every particle in your composite electrode. And if you zoom in with TEM, you see a nicely conformal few layered graphing coating. Does it actually add value? Well, in the case of lithium manganese oxide, the famous problem is that when you cycle it, you lose manganese from the cathode into the electrolyte, and then it migrates across the electrolyte to the anode, where it also corrupts the anode. So in a full cell battery, lithium manganese oxide never performs well. And that's what we see here on the right. This is a full cell capacity retention versus cycling curve. And we can see very rapid degradation of a lithium manganese oxide based full cell battery. In contrast, for our graphene coated LMO, we see much more stable cycling. This is our first evidence that we've suppressed manganese dissolution and thereby improved the cycling stability of the battery. In addition, because graphene is electrically conductive, we've improved the electrical conductivity of the electrode, which means that you can get 
higher kinetics and therefore higher cycling rates. And that's illustrated here, where now we're going to vary the cycling rate. 1C means we're charging and discharging in an hour. 20C means we're charging and discharging in three minutes. And pink is the control. And as you can see in the control, if you try to charge or discharge too quickly, you get incomplete charge or discharge. This is, of course, well known from everyday life. Whereas for the graphene coated case, we do much better, preserving about 75% capacity in a three minute charge discharge cycle. So this all looks quite promising. We have higher stability, we have higher rate performance. The problem though is that the way that we form that coating is via random interaction of the graphene with the active materials. And if you need a conformal coating with no pinholes, that means you need to put in a lot of extra graphene to make sure that all the pinholes are filled. And that's a problem because graphene is dead weight and dead space in the battery. And so the question is, is there some more clever way that you can get graphene to go only to the surface of your particles and nowhere else? And the way you do that is via so-called Pickering emulsion strategy. So in a Pickering emulsion, what you do is you take two emissible solvents, in this case, acetonitrile and hexane. And if you were to put those both in a beaker and leave it on the bench top and come back, you would find that it phase separated like oil and water. However, if you add graphene ethyl cellulose to that two-phase mixture, it will be recruited to the interface, stabilizing the interface, thereby allowing you to increase that interfacial area substantially. And as well, if you agitate that solution, you'll now form small droplets of hexane with a graphene coating in an acetonitrile exterior. By tuning the values of the acetonitrile and the hexane, you can control the emulsion size such that this droplet size is just a little bit bigger than the particles you're trying to coat. The particles you're trying to coat disperse selectively in hexane compared to acetonitrile, and therefore they're recruited to the inside of these droplets. Remember, there's a graphene coating at the surface of this droplet. We then exploit the fact that hexane has a lower boiling point than acetonitrile, and therefore fractional distillation will boil off the hexane first, collapsing that droplet, thereby depositing your graphene around your particle. This leads to absolutely beautiful coatings at an order of magnitude less graphene than just randomly mixing them together which now implies that you can push your performance to the theoretical limit. Since you have so little carbon in this electrode, your gravimetric capacity and your volumetric capacity approach theoretical limits. This approach, while we first demonstrated it for lithium manganese oxide, works for whatever cathode chemistry you like. Nowadays, companies like Tesla prefer nickel-rich cathodes like nickel cobalt aluminum oxide. This is no problem. You can coat whatever material you want. This allows you now to come up with a scheme which we believe is commercially viable, and our new company, Valexion, is taking this to market. To again drive home the point that this works for a variety of chemistries, we've recently looked at lithium nickel oxide. This material is of high interest because not only it's higher capacity, but it has no cobalt in it. And cobalt is a real problem from a supply chain perspective. The problem with lithium nickel oxide, though, is that when you cycle it to high potential, you get oxygen evolution from the electrode. And that leads to a cascade of problems that also ultimately leads to, cas to capacity fade. And we can see this very clearly as we're charging lithium nickel oxide electrode and then monitoring via mass spec, we can see clear oxygen evolution at the high potential condition. In contrast with the graphene coating, since graphene is impermeable to most gases, including oxygen, we can go to high charging potential and see no oxygen evolution. And predictably, this leads to better uh, capacity stability than the absence of graphene. So even materials like lithium nickel oxide, which were previously not commercially viable, may now become commercially viable with this graphene coating. And just for completeness, I will note that while we primarily work on cathodes in our lab, we've also done this for anode materials such as lithium, titanium, silicon oxide. On the anode side, it also adds value by controlling the SEI layer, by improving the conductivity of the electrode, and thereby enabling higher rate performance. And so the bottom line is there is an opportunity for 2D materials to improve the cathode and the anode. 
The final frontier would be the electrolyte itself. And of course, 2D materials would only make sense for the electrolyte if that electrolyte were a solid. And of course, solid electrolytes would be great because they're safer. There's no flammable solvent in the solid electrolyte. They have better thermal and chemical stability and easier packaging since solids don't leak out of a cell. And of course, we're not alone in realizing the value of a solid state electrolyte. There are many materials being explored around the world. I'm not going to walk you through these in any detail other than to point out that each of them has some issue, like high interfacial resistance or low ion conductivity, high cost, poor processability, et cetera. And so solid state electrolytes have not really penetrated the market yet. There's not a good choice. And so the way we're going to attempt to impact this component of the battery is to go to hexagonal boron nitride. And the reason is that HBN, as I already showed you, is very stable and works well as a separator. And a solid electrolyte has to play the role of a separator in addition to being an ion transport medium. HBN alone will not be a good ion transporter. But if you blend HBN with an ionic liquid, which is a good ion transporter, then you have the possibility of forming a so-called ionogel where you get high ion, ion conductivity in a solid form. And this is a concept that has been pursued previously, but the typical solid matrices have been polymers. Polymers plus liquids means poor mechanical integrity. And so this has never really made it because you have lithium dendrite growth problems with polymer-based ion gels. In contrast, what we're gonna do is use exfoliated HBN as a solid matrix. And what this is going to facilitate is much stronger gelation and thereby improving the mechanical properties without compromising ionic conductivity. How you prepare this is pretty simple. We take our exfoliated HBN, we blend it with the ionic liquid until we achieve a gelation condition. We then measure the mechanical properties versus ionic conductivity. We see that we get high stiffness and high ionic conductivity concurrently. This is ideal for a solid state electrolyte. In addition, because there's a strong interaction between the HBN and the ionic liquid, you also modulate the electrochemical properties, particularly improving the stability at high voltage conditions. And that's illustrated here on the left. I just have the ionic liquid and we see very fast capacity fade at high potentials. Whereas for the ion or gel, we can see much reduced capacity fade and much more stable performance. And so you can probably guess that if you now make solid state battery using the HBN ion gel, you get very stable performance, high coulombic efficiencies, little to no capacity fade for hundreds of cycles. So this looks pretty darn promising, except there's a catch. And the catch is that every curve that I've shown you has been between one volt and five volts. And the reason is that the ionic liquid that we're using, namely EMIM TFSI, is unstable outside of this stability window. And that's a problem because what you want to have is a high voltage cathode coupled with a low voltage anode like graphite. And we can't get down to the low voltage range. And so you may be tempted to just change your ionic liquid. And you can do that. You can go from EMIM TFSI to EMIM FSI. And that will allow you to get down to graphite's low potential. But then you give up the high potential. And so you're stuck. However, you slice this, the change in voltage between the high and low potential condition is only four volts and that will limit the energy density of your battery but because these are solids you can now do something that you can't do with a liquid electrolyte and that is make a layered heterostructure ion gel where now we're just going to have the high potential ion gel on the cathode side the low potential ion gel on the anode side and thereby only at the interface are you going to be seeing an intermediate potential where both Ionogels are stable. This works uh, quite nicely. What I'm showing you here is the layered heterostructure case, where now we're going to have graphite as the anode and NMC as the cathode. So we're going to be using the full voltage range. And in red, we can see very high coulombic efficiencies and stable cycling. In contrast, if you just mix the two ionic liquids together, such that they're both touching both electrodes, you see very quick capacity fade because they're both decomposing. The catch though, is that everything I've shown you is done by taking ionic liquids and HBN and grinding it together with a mortar and pestle, which can be done by a graduate student in a research laboratory to make a coin cell. 
but it's certainly not a scalable manufacturing method. And so in the most recent work from our lab, we've taken on that manufacturing challenge. What we do is we form the ionogel and then we dilute it with a polar diluent solvent, DMF, converting it into a slurry that's compatible with blade coating. So now you can just blade coat this onto your electrodes, which is standard practice in battery manufacturing. Because it's a liquid as it goes down, and then it solidifies upon solvent evaporation, you get very nice interfaces between the iron gel and your typically less than planar electrodes. That very strong interfacial contact allows you to achieve very stable cycling and very high rate performance. In this case, using lithium metal as your anode. Moreover, as I showed you before, if you further tune the solid loading, you can go after different additive manufacturing methods. In this case, if we go to lower viscosity conditions, we get a screen printable HBN ionogel ink. And with that, we can now fully screen print our lithium ion batteries. This would be useful for printed electronics applications. This now allows us to have integrated with your printed thin film transistors an on substrate energy storage solution. So with that, to let me conclude, I tried to make two points today. The first is that tunable solution rheology provides a suite of printable nanomaterial inks for added manufacturing. And secondly, atomically thin materials enable a wide variety of new device concepts, including anti-amipolar heterojunctions for artificial neurons, neuromorphic mem transistors for gate tunable synapses, high rate lithium ion batteries and heterostructured ionogels. And with that, let me conclude by thanking my research group at Northwestern University. Also want to thank the funding agencies for supporting the work in my lab and thank all of you for your kind attention. So now we're going to go to Okay, uh, thanks for the very impressive talk. I have a question about uh, your coronavirus sensor based yeah. on the PhD electronics. Uh, one, might, one is the, the question of limit in this case, and uh, I mean, the, is the electron kind of stable in bioenvironments, uh, like a long term degradation to environment and problem like that? Yeah. So the, I'll answer the second question first. Graphene is exceptionally stable. So we've seen no lifetime issues or degradation issues in the electrolyte. So that seems to be fine. In terms of the sensitivity, you can sort of see the numbers here. You can get down to nanogram per milliliter level. Uh, I think this is suitable uh, for most um, applications of, of COVID detection. So I think this is appropriate. Uh, in fact, this work is funded by the CDC uh, in the US. Uh, they tell us that this is sufficient for their purposes. Do you need a kind of like a special printer to print your ink or do you need some like Standard a screen printer. Standard screen printer. That's right. Yeah. So in the first generation, we did aerosol jet printing. Aerosol jet printing is a little bit more precise than screen printing. But in our second generation design, we, we relaxed the tolerances and still got sufficient performance. This was very important to CDC because they wanted to be able to scale this up. Please. I have two questions. The first question is, how did you get evaporated frequencies of Yeah, so in the aerosol jet printer, the aerosolization process, which in aerosol jet printing they call atomization process, is achieved via sonication at megahertz frequencies. This is actually not that uncommon. If you go to the semiconductor industry, a lot of the sonication baths are run at megahertz frequencies. And the reason is that the cavitation of the bubbles is more controlled than kilohertz frequencies. This appears to be critical for thinning without chopping up the flakes. That's, that's usually the trade-off. The more you sonicate in a typical ultrasonicator, you make them thinner, but you're also decreasing the lateral size. The controlled cavitation here uh, overcomes that trade off, and so you get very thin and relatively large flakes. The second question is here about bone uh, nitride. I yeah. want to have that type of conductivity for sodium ions. 
Yeah, so that's one thing I'll point out now that you asked the question. In addition to the ionic liquid, we put in lithium salt. So that's lithium TFSI. So you can see here it's EMIM TFSI, which is the ionic liquid, and then lithium TFSI. So that's for lithium ion battery. But if you use sodium TFSI, then you get sodium ion transport. So this can work, I think, for most cations. We haven't tested all of them, but there's nothing fundamentally that would prevent you from going after other chemistries. Please. Uh, thanks for your inquiry talk. I'm significantly on that group, and I have two questions. And first one is, what do you think about the main challenge for the uh, <clears throat> fixed dimension or the remote computing devices? Yeah, so I would say right now the biggest challenge is speed. So these devices, like most non volatile memristor type devices, rely upon defect motion. In our case, uh, we believe it's sulfur vacancies, but it may also be oxygen inter interstitial. It's hard to sort of tease out which it is. But however you slice it, there's mass transport occurring. And that is much slower than charge transport. So these devices don't operate at the frequencies we're used to in electronics. One thing I will say about that, though, is the brain doesn't operate at gigahertz frequencies and operates at kilohertz frequencies. And these happily work at kilohertz frequencies. So if our goal is to really mimic the brain, I think the speed is fine. Of course, we don't have all the functionality of the brain yet. So getting more and more sophisticated heterosynaptic responses uh, would be another ongoing challenge. Okay, and next question is, uh, does the two companies work your own company? Those companies were spun out of my lab. Oh. I'm the founder of both of them, oh. yes. And is there any uh, some difficulty to operate the energy that your lab and the most companies? Well, I mean, the, the good news is that the chief engineers and chief technical officers of those companies are alumni of my group. And so they're very talented and they worked in my lab for many years. So we can communicate very efficiently. They don't need me to micromanage them. So the key is having good students and postdocs and employees at your startup companies. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I I think you kind of moved, like explained briefly, like the slide 36. Yeah. Uh, you show some, like, a kind of, you know, that talk and training of your. Uh, yeah, so I, I can walk you through this. Yeah. So can you explain a little bit? Yeah, okay. Now? So, how this works is in a typical neural network, you would perform some training. So, let's say we're going to train this neural network to recognize the digits one and zero. So we would send a bunch of ones and zeros at this neural network. And then if I put in an unknown number, it could detect a one and zero effectively. That's what's being depicted here. That's well-trained for one and zero. What we do though, is we take this neural network and we split it into two. We continue to train group A with ones and zeros. So we're, we're further baking in its ability to recognize one and zero. But we change the gate on the second half such that when you bring in the training data for one and zero, instead of hardening the response, you're weakening the response. You're basically causing it to forget the one and zero. So you can see the one and zero fading away. It's being forgotten. What we then do is train the entire network on the task of three and four. The upper half of your neural network doesn't learn three and four because one and zero is already baked in. <clears throat> on the other hand, the second half, the group B, now effectively learns three and four because it already forgot one and zero. And so what this means is that your neural network can learn a new task without completely forgetting the first task. And that's being shown here. If we were to look at task one, after we teach a task two, we lose some accuracy, but we gain a lot on task two, such that the average is still acceptably high. And that's the issue in spiking neural networks is you have to have a trade off between accuracy and resource allocation. You can get really good at one thing, 
But then if you want to do something different, you have to give up everything you had before. This allows us to do both at a high or acceptable level of accuracy at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, so let me ask one very simple general question. No, not everyone. So I was very surprised to know that your major was electrical engineering because now you know what your science is very rare. So how could you uh, learn what your science related subject in your career? Yeah, so I think a lot of it came down to uh, where I did my PhD, which was in the Beckman Institute at the University of Illinois. The Beckman Institute is a highly interdisciplinary research institute. And so while my degree is, is officially in electrical engineering, my PhD committee had one material science faculty, one chemistry, one physics, and one double E. And so I had to be able to answer questions from all of those faculty <laughs> during my PhD. And uh, that um, makes me I guess sufficiently conversant in all four of those fields that when I was in the faculty market, I could uh, consider more than just electrical engineering. Thank you very much. And, uh, so, country, you are the director of the Material Research Center at Northwestern. So, can you briefly introduce the center? Yeah. So, the Materials Research Center is a umbrella organization at Northwestern to unite all efforts in material science. And that, of course, includes material science and engineering department, but material science is present in many other departments at Northwestern, as I'm sure it's true at Seoul National. And so the Materials Research Center helps coordinate such activities uh, to go after multi-PI funding opportunities. Our anchor grant is the Materials Research Science and Engineering Center from the National Science Foundation that has about 30 faculty members in it, but there's several other such multi-PI grants. Uh, the uh, Materials Research Center also oversees the public facilities related to material science. And that, of course, is used not only by material science, but virtually all departments on campus, even in fields that are seemingly disparate, like in the life sciences, you still need electron microscopes, and those are used in that same facility. So that's what the MRC is about. Thank you very much. So, is there any questions or comments? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you a question. It's kind of related to my biases and so on. So, yeah. have you tried to uh, build some uh, like changes of type devices uh, using printed graphene electrodes and semiconducting carbon nanotubes? Uh, if you do, uh, if you, how was the performance of those type devices? Yeah, we are not doing that currently. So, we're focusing on the electrochemical detection. Um, there are definitely groups around the world that do that. And I think, you know, the challenge is that those devices, they tend to be sensitive to any charges in proximity. So you can get responses that that may not be due solely from your target analyte. Whereas uh, these electrochemical um, biosensors they're very sensitive to anything that's on the electrode surface. So as long as you eliminate non-specific binding, they work very well. No, no, what, what I'm saying is that the biosensor just to have you be the transistor device? Oh, just transistors, yeah. Transistors. Sure. Uh, how's the device uh, like performance like mobility? Oh yeah. Yeah. So we can print with mobilities routinely over 100 centimeters squared per volt second. So more like the the hero devices are approaching 200 centimeters square per volt second. They're quite, they're quite good for printed electronics. In fact, I really, you didn't see me show any printed 2D transistors because nanotubes always beat them. So I think 2D materials have other opportunities, as I mentioned, like photo detectors, sensors, and so on. But for a straight up transistor, I would use carbon nanotubes. The, challenge which has been overcome to some extent is getting good p and n type behavior nanotubes are preferred to be p type in ambient conditions because oxygen withdraws electrons there are some n type doping strategies that we and others have pursued 
they work well, but they do require encapsulation. So it's it's a solvable problem, but I think there is still an opportunity for an n-type semiconductor, which is printable, high mobility, and doesn't require some fancy encapsulation. Actually, it's right now. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I was going to like uh, think about commercializing some of the activated bio sensors. Yeah. Your pretty electron is changing your like, process solution. Sometimes different kind of worrying about uh, how to like, produce those devices and 